Um, hey everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, it's May 16th and here's another edition of the Cerebris Developer Community Meeting. Um, today, um, we have a, a pretty interesting agenda. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah, we'll go through some developer community updates. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Cerebris software release that was um, recently made available. And then we'll, uh, we'll allow Daria to go ahead and deliver her presentation on using and deploying Cerebrus GPT. Just wanna go through a few community updates that we've had since the last time we've, we've all met. Um, as usual, if you have a meeting topic that you're interested in us uh, presenting on, um, please email us at developer at cerebrus.net. Um, we do have a Cerebrus Discord server now. Um, there's over a, a thousand people on it. So if you're interested in having a conversation, asking questions or engaging the, the public about usage Cerebrus GPT or anything else related to Cerebrus, um, you know, please sign up here. And um, once I'm done talking, I'll post all these links in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Cerebrus GPT is also on Hugging Face. Um, we've seen um, some exciting volume of downloads on our, of our models. All ranging from 111 million to 13 billion. So if you're interested in using some of these models, please, you know, check out the link on Hugging Face. Um, if you're interested in more of the discourse style of communication with us, we still have our Cerebrus Discord discourse page. Uh, there's an active conversation all that's going on there, um, mainly more on the uh, usage of our Cerebrus SDK. But yep, if you're um, if you're interested in in chatting with us there, um, check out the discourse page. And finally, um, we have an active survey going on right now just to kind of gauge the interest of our, our Cerebrus GPT developers. So um, if you wanted to share how you're using it, what you'd like to see next, um, anything along those lines, um, feel free to submit your responses to our um, survey via the SurveyMonkey link here. Um, just as a friendly reminder, uh, we have a, uh, an exciting product that we recently launched called the Cerebrus AI Model Studio Launchpad. Um, this is an extension of our AI Model Studio in that it allows users to um, basically submit, configure, run, monitor the status of a training job, and then um, export your uh, trained weights all from our uh, new CLI. Um, just as with the previous Cerebrus AI Model Studio, all the models are still available. Um, with the Model Studio Launchpad, um, except that it's just uh, as easy as running about five, five commands now. So if you're curious, um, feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to uh, share more details about this with you. And finally, um, we recently had a software release, so I wanted to just share a few highlights. Um, we do have expanded model support. So now T5 models up to 11 billion parameters. Um, BERT can be trained or pre-trained with the 30,000 uh, token input sequence. Um, and we've, we've now also have made um, uh, improvements to our uh, CV model support. So 3D unit for image segmentation, 2D unit with um, you know, 50 megapixel uh, image size support, and then 2D ResNet with uh, 1K by 1K pixels. On the more of the usability side of things, um, we do now offer a Cerebrus to hug, Hugging Face uh, checkpoint conversion tool to make it easier for you to take uh, trained weights with us, um, convert it to the familiar Hugging Face interface and um, do as you wish with it. Um, we also provide the ability to evaluate models now throughout a long training run and several features that improve the training of large language models and finally um, better documentation because who doesn't want better documentation? All right, with that said, I'll pause and hand the uh, mic over to Daria. Daria um, will be presenting today on using and deploying Cerebrus GPT. Thank you, Ray. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Daria Soboliva. I'm a senior ML engineer at Cerebrus, and I'm uh, happy to present this presentation for you today. I would also like to learn more about what you guys are building. Uh, what you guys are working on with regards to either fine-tuning those GPT style networks, whether it's Cerebrus GPT checkpoint or some other GPT style models, um, or if you're interested in pre-training something uh, like that yourself, I would also uh, pretty much uh, be happy to hear uh, what you guys are up to. 
In case there are some questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask them at any time. I'm happy to pause and discuss it. Um, I, I would like it to be less of a lecture and more about the discussion uh, and sharing ideas. Okay, uh, so for their agenda today, uh, I'm going to discuss the uh, what is the Cerberus GPT network. Um, then we will talk about the compute uh, optimal and inference optimal trainings. What's the difference? Uh, then I will showcase the uh, state of the art inference efficient models and what's the difference with the compute optimal at the pre training time. Um, then we will talk about the steps that you need to take usually when you pre when you develop your own model. Um, at the pre-training stage and also at the inference stage. Those are best practices, best practices steps that usually people follow. Uh, then they will talk about uh, how you can do that on different types of hardware and Cerebris included. Um, then uh, I will talk about the general steps of the data set preparation. It's uh, usually the same steps for both pre-training and fine-tuning with a few caveats. Um, and uh, just wanted to highlight that step because it's one of the important factors to improve the quality of your model further. Um, then uh, we will talk about the Red Pyjama V2, which is I'm really excited about. Uh, it's rubrics we are working on the next uh, generation of the Red Pyjama data set. And uh, I will share with you the details. And um, also uh, I will talk about the customization, what kind of data set preparation tools you can use. Uh, the specific needs. I will highlight a few most popular, but in case you have some ideas, I would, I would be happy to hear that. And then we will go through the steps of deploying your own model, what they usually people do, uh, what are the best practices, and uh, of course, uh, your feedback is very much appreciated here. Okay, um, so for the Cerebus GPT, it's a family of compute optimal large language models that are trained on PileV1 and on the Cerebus Vapor Scale Cluster. Uh, they are trained with a chinchilla style compute schedule, which is 20 tokens per parameter, which is the compute which is considered as compute optimal um, training schedule at the at the pre-training time. Now um, you can see the plot at the right. We are comparing different Cerberus GPT style networks with others like PVA, GPT, J, NeoX models. And uh, those were trained with um, more inference optimal um, idea in mind. Um, but in terms of the pre training compute optimal schedule, the Cerberus GPT is following Chinchilla style. Um, so in addition to uh, following the Chinchilla style per training, we also added the MUP parameterization to the networks that allowed us to um, find the best hyperparameters or basically zero shot uh, hyperparameters from smaller networks into the larger networks without looking for hyperparameters like grid searching for every model size. That helps a lot with the uh, increase in model size. It's really hard to uh, do a lot of um, iterations to find the best hyperparameters. So all the models that we released, um, as you did mentioned, there are placed in hugging phase. You can build on top. Uh, there is, you can do whatever you want with those checkpoints. And um, those are models that are trained from scratch. We also share all the recipes and um, uh, details about the MUP parameterization. Um, so yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell, the Cerebrus GPT style networks. Now, um, so, as we touch base, what is the pre-train optimal training? Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the difference between uh, inference optimal and uh, the uh, compute optimal? So at the inference time, we care about the uh, uh, compute cost basically is a function of the model size and also the number of inference tokens. As you see to the right that we compared, uh, what are the uh, what are the basically uh, the loss values uh, or the benefits of increasing, uh, if, if we increase the number of inference tokens given the model size, um, what are the best uh, schedules? And it turns out that uh, compute optimal doesn't necessarily mean that we are inference optimal. At the left, you have 20 billion inference tokens and your uh, and Cerebrus GPT style is winning over uh, PTA, for example. But if you go to the right, if you increase the number of inference tokens, then PTA becomes better. So if you are, uh, if you mostly care about the inference optimal training that you should consider, um, in, you should consider a different schedule. So this is what we are trying to, I'm trying to explain right now. Instead of doing the chinchilla uh, schedule with a 20 tokens per parameter, we need to consider something better. Um, 
And um, as I said, uh, it is um, usually a number of like if if we if we care about the compute cost, the inference time. Um, it's either we decrease the model size or we decrease the number of inferences. But it is usually hard to decrease the number of inferences because you have an ongoing application, for example, and um, you want to feed it a lot of data. Um, so the other thing that we can decrease here is the model size. But if we just simply decrease the model size, uh, we, we are going to lose an accuracy. So the idea here is to decrease the model size but preserve the same model accuracy. Um, now, how we can do that? We can change the schedule, right? Instead of 20 tokens per parameter, we can try to train it for longer um, and see if the model uh, can uh, benefit from that. So PTM models were overtrained. They are not compute optimal, but they were trained for mid much, much longer uh, tokens. And this is why they outperform it at the inference time. So now uh, let's, let's try to see what would be the most optimal schedule for the inference optimal models. Um, Oh yeah, I also wanted to showcase a, a very nice tool. Um, if you're interested, click on the link. Uh, this link uh, will help you understand what would be the, um, if, you, if you specify the model, the number of uh, talk, the number of parameters, like for example, here it's 10 billion of parameters and a number of training tokens, uh, for example, 200 as in chinchilla style, then um, this tool allows you to predict the loss value. What is the estimated loss value at the end of this training, but also helps you to convert the uh, compute optimal to the inference optimal. So for example, here from chinchilla to llama, um, and llama is currently, uh, well, already not, but uh, one of the state-of-the-art models that shows you with what schedule you can actually uh, get the, uh, the inference optimal model. So um, in, in our example here, uh, 10 billion parameters model trained for 200 tokens in Chinchilla style can be converted to 5 billion parameters models that's trained on uh, 558 billions of tokens. So it is way over-trained. However, it is small enough and uh, serves the purpose to be deployed at, at the inference time. Um, if we went with the chinchilla style, what we wanted to do with the 558 billion tokens, we would want to go with large model size. But since this is not very efficient at the inference time, it makes more sense to get uh, to, to pipe in more data and over train it. Um, so yeah, check it out, very useful tool um, and helps you understand uh, what style do you want to train with and uh, what do you want to serve if the compute optimal or the inference uh, optimal. Okay, um, so yeah, coming back to different types of models, uh, this is the state of the art, um, the inference efficient models. Um, I'm sharing the plot to the right with the llama from llama paper. You can see that um, there are way more uh, billions of tokens that these models were trained on um, than two to 20 TPP, 20 tokens per parameter. Uh, so something like 7 billion was like trained with uh, 100, I think 150 uh, tokens per parameter, etc. Uh, interesting to, to find that 65 billion model was actually trained with 20 tokens per parameter. So uh, maybe Meta uh, authors, uh, Meta decided to replicate the chinchilla style first and then found this nice feature that as you continue uh, training, even after you uh, reach this 20 tokens per parameter, the model still improves in quality and serves the best at the downstream performance later. Um, uh, all the, uh, other inference efficient models are MPT 7 billion, uh, the model released by Mosaic ML, uh, Pythia, as I said, GPT 2 billion from, by NVIDIA, uh, Red Pajama 7 billion model. Um, so all these all this models were, um, they're small enough so you can deploy them on your application, but they are, they consume so much, so much data that they are much better than um, getting the compute optimal models at your inference time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the highlight here. Um, again, like, uh, the idea we haven't, the community haven't figured out what exactly is the, uh, optimal schedule, how many tokens per parameter you need at the, in, uh, to, to serve the inference efficient models. But this strategy here is to utilize as much data as possible, um, and, uh, train until, uh, and train as the training cost decreases. So uh, I think there will be a lot of new discoveries in that space, but um, the data set preparation and the, the size of the data set matters a lot in all this inference efficient models training. So 
we will cover that as well. Okay, so uh, to cover like the best uh, practices, steps that we usually go with at the pre-training stage, first, we need to prepare the data set. And as I already highlighted, it is a very important stage that we spend some time curating the data set, understanding the insights of the data set, calculating the number of tokens in this data set, filtering, et cetera. So this stage really contributes to all the next stages, uh, whether it's pre-training from scratch or fine tuning uh, from the checkpoint and measuring the quality on the downstream tasks. Um, then um, we will. Uh, then the next stage is you need to decide which strategy you want to uh, go with. Um, and um, this would be like whether I want to train the compute optimal model or I want to train the inference optimal model. Um, in that case, I, I believe like most of people here would like to have the best model at the downstream task performance or like at the, whatever application you work on. And uh, in that case, I would I would advise to use the inference optimal model versus compute optimal. Uh, but if you're doing some interesting research on how to optimize the training of these large language models at the pre-training stage, uh, I very much advise to use the compute optimal because you can iterate faster and um, you can uh, explore some other hypothesis and maybe derive this uh, the, the, the inference optimal schedule. Um, then we need to think about the model family selection. So most of the people probably would select GPT style networks, though there are a bunch of other networks like BERT, T5, uh, et cetera, computer vision models. Uh, so depending on your application, you want to specify which model you want to train. Um, and then we select the architecture. There are a lot of already uh, available models like uh, from, from tiny, small, medium to large, x large, etc. Um, you can sp you can select one of the existing configs and you can go to Cerebris Hagen phase as well and get the configs from uh, for 111 million models up to 13 billion models. Um, or you can you can try to explore yourself. You can make it wider. You can make it deeper and, and see what serves the best uh, for your specific needs. Um, OK, so the next thing we need to decide on the training regime. Um, that that would make uh, the training regime basically it's the selection of hyperparameters, uh, which sequence lengths you want to train it with. Um, if you think about like some uh, fine tuning tasks like the summarization that requires you a lot of context, right? Then you might think about increasing the context length at the pre training stage as well. So model have the capacity to work with a very large sequence lengths later on. Um, also, something like uh, positional embeddings could help you a lot here. Um, there are a bunch of different types of positional embeddings. So if you're thinking about changing the max sequence length uh, from the pre-training stage to the fine-tuning stage, that your choice probably would lie around rotary embeddings or the alibi embeddings versus Laurent embeddings. So it is easier to adjust it. And um, alibi embeddings, for example, are proven to, to work a, uh, very good with uh, um, if you per train with a small sequence length like 2000, the increasing that like in 10K, 30K uh, still works the best. Um, if you guys uh, want to check out the Alibi paper, I highly recommend that. Um, then we also need to decide with precision level we want to work with that can help you understand the trade off between the accuracy and the uh, training time, the performance in samples per second. Um, there are different types of precision levels. You can also combine different types together, like uh, float 32, B float 16, uh, et cetera. Um, and finally, if you want to use MUVI parameterization, we highly recommend to do that, especially if you're training from scratch. And um, the recipes on how to enable that are available in our paper. Um, just to, um, in case others are, are not aware, could you um, explain a little bit about what mu parameterization is? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is the change in the architecture where we just uh, provide the scaling for different types of the model. Uh, that would be multiplying the uh, embedding matrices, multiplying the initialization to the factor that allows us to transfer zero shot transfer hyperparameters from smaller networks into larger networks without the uh, change in hyperparameters. That's as it's in a nutshell, but if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, you either check out our paper or the original paper, uh, new paper metrization, the maximal, uh, proximal, maximal uh, uh, proximal update, yeah. And it's also really easy to add um, 
if you want to add it to your, your own model, uh, you can just follow the recipe from us or from the original implementation. And then um, the next stage after you have the pre-trained model, you need to think about the steps at the inference time. Um, that would involve both zero shot uh, inference or if you want to fine tune your model for a few steps. What you need to think about first is also data set preparation. And um, usually like before the child GPT uh, changes, people would just create a supervised fine tuning data set where you have like an example and an example has a label and you learn this label. Uh, but after the chat GPT um, uh, was, was released, basically uh, people started following a different idea, um, which is you have a few stages. Um, I also like, I recommend reading the instruct GPT uh, paper because that one has a lot of details on how that can be implemented. Um, so basically you have a few stages. The first one, you, so you have a supervised fine tuning. It's exactly what I just mentioned uh, that people were following before child GPT. You have um, a, an assessor, you have an example, and an assessor marks this example, uh, provides uh, a label for this example. Um, afterwards, you, uh, there is a next stage that assessor is given uh, a list of predictions by the model given the prompt and uh, the assessor tries to rank those outputs and we're training the reward model here to understand what is the best answer for the specific prompt. And after that, there's the third stage where uh, there is a PPO optimization. This is the, uh, the reinforcement learning um, algorithm that helps you optimize the policy given the reward. Um, so you have like an agent which interacts with the environment uh, and the environment is basically could be you uh, if you interact with ChatGPT and um, uh, the authors of this application of uh, gathering the feedback. And then you're trying to provide the best answer um, that maximizes the reward. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more about that and how the steps can be implemented, I highly recommend Instruct GPT paper. That one was released before ChatGPT and has a lot of details on that. But the stages here involve a lot of, uh, so if, specifically if you have your custom application um, where you cannot find those data sets available uh, online, like uh, most of the time you can find some very good supervised fine tuning data sets, but whenever you like hit the reward model training or PPO optimization, it really depends on what type of model you want to train, you want to deploy. Um, so that might involve you actually hiring some people and uh, assessing uh, the outputs and curating the model. Um, okay, so after we fix the data set and understand what we want to go with either the supervised fine tuning or the reinforcement learning with human feedback, uh, we need to understand what is the compute budget for us? What is the biggest model size we want to deploy? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that your per train model size is what you want to go with it in fine tuning stage. Uh, but one of the obvious things is model compression. Uh, you can actually quantize, distill it, sparse, sparsify it at the fine tuning stage. Um, or uh, uh, if, if you want to, um, basically, yeah, like um, I would just go with that, uh, with, the, with the model compression stage here. Um, and then when, whenever you want to fine tune your model, you probably want to start with a specific initialization. Um, there are a lot of checkpoints that are available online. I would just recommend changing, checking the license. Um, you can start, for example, with the Cerebus GPT checkpoint, initialize with that and uh, train your own, um, or, or train your own checkpoint, and initialize your fine tuning model from that. The, the benefit here is this, uh, um, with, with the checkpoint initialization, you don't have to learn some basics of the language or uh, whatever your application is about. Like uh, if, you, if, you, um, if you do the um, copilot, like uh, GitHub copilot application, then you want the model to learn some basis, basics about coding at the pre-training stage as well, in addition to just language, right? Um, so all these stages, um, the, the pre-training part helps you get like the fundamentals learned first. And then you can, you can fine tune it to the specific application with a smaller data set with the, with the less effort. Um, and yeah, uh, you also want to understand what kind of training regime you, you what, what is your training regime design? Um, if you, if for example, you train with a 2000, um, 
sequence length to the pre-training stage and suddenly your application needs like a lot bigger sequence length you can try to do that uh, with the diff like you, you can try to lower in the different types of embeddings uh, even though you, for example, trained with rotary embeddings with a 2K MSL, you can increase that to, for example, 32K MSL, though I would recommend going with Alibi in that case. Um, so yeah, like uh, think about your application, what kind of the data set you have, what are the sequence length there? And uh, of course, tune the hyperparameters um, and, uh, for the specific um, laws that you are computing in that application. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, model compression, if you think that the model is too large, you can train, uh, you can distill it, this teacher model, big, big model into this model model, you can quantize it, you can also sparsify it um, if you want. So basically, those are the usual steps that we go through when we create uh, the inference pipeline. I would just add as well here that you want to set up some metrics validation. Um, in addition to computing the loss, you also want to verify the quality. It's either accuracy or perplexity, or whatever you compute, uh, to make sure that even if you optimize your model further and you see the decrease in loss, this is affected to by the uh, the downstream tasks that you care about. Okay. Hey, Dari, um, I actually have a question on that previous slide. Um, on yep. the last thing you just mentioned <clears throat> with regards to metrics, um, when you've deployed your model. Uh, in production, um, is there? Um, do you recommend some form of like a real-time metrics monitoring system? Um, is there a particular metric that in in real time would alert you to either retrain your model or you know signal something's going wrong? Yeah, definitely recommend that. Um, I would just say we might past experience, we wouldn't just add the metrics that monitor the model quality at the runtime. We also would have the metric that would monitor uh, like the current, if we have like a repository that is shared across other teams and people are committing in there, you are developing your own model. You want to monitor the quality of this model, like maybe daily, uh, to understand like if there are any, if there are any like uh, uh, downs, in, in the, if there are any downgrades in the loss value. Uh, but yeah, um, usually people implement the online metrics and they monitor the quality on them to see like if. For some reason, uh, the model starts uh, behaving worse. That could be an indicator for you, for example, that um, either there was a bug introduced or uh, if you are collecting feedback uh, proactively from your users and improving the model given that feedback, then the model be may become, um, I would say, like more prone to making some specific errors just because your users are asking those specific questions. Right, so I recommend having not just one metric that you look at, like accuracy, um, or I don't know, perplexity, um, or um, there are some other metrics you can follow depending on the application, right? Like some classification metrics that you can look at uh, or regression metrics. But um, yeah, I would also recommend having like a list of different metrics that you look at and um, uh, understanding what's happening with the model if some of them are going down. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so now, uh, if you if you want to train the model from scratch, right? Like if you if you want to deal with either pre-training or inference yourself, um, the fine-tuning stage yourself, you might want to understand what kind of what kind of hardware you 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 can obtain. Um, so here I highlight the differences, like uh, the different types of hardware. There is NVIDIA hardware. There is also Cerebus uh, hardware. There may may, may more uh, way more hardware is available. Um, you can also do the inference on the CPU if you wish with a very small model. Um, now, like the difference here, um, I would say if you have a very large model, you want to pre-train from scratch. I think yeah, the, the, the one of the easiest, one, one of the nice things about Cerebrus is that you don't have to think about all the different scaling techniques that usually are required on the, on the NVIDIA hardware, like fully shorted data parallel or uh, tensor parallelism or model parallelism, all that stuff. You don't have to think about it. A Cerebrus, GPT, a Cerebrus uh, hardware has the data parallelism, which is the simplest one. So basically, if you are a user, you can just uh, change the size of the network in your config file and specify uh, uh, and, and specify other parameters. Like if you change the size, you probably want to change the other parameters, but that's basically it. You don't have to change the code. 
there are only changes in, in the config file that are required. And um, that's pretty nice because um, even though like you might heard about this words like uh, data, uh, the model parallelism, fully sharded data parallelism, et cetera, um, some hybrid versions of that, it's it's not that easy to implement, especially if you haven't had experience doing that uh, in the past. So um, if uh, if if you have like a team of people that uh, you can ask to uh, create all this efficient parallelization uh, methods first before you even start training the model, then uh, you can go with NVIDIA. But if you really care about the final application and you just want to start training as, as you have the data, as you have the metrics, prepare everything, then uh, I really recommend the push button interface from Cerebras here. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. Um, we are also working on some interesting um, sparsity uh, trainings for uh, large language models and beyond that. Um, so if you're interested, check out our white papers about it. And we believe that uh, sparsity is the way to go with these large language models because uh, they're just over parameterized and uh, the results so far are promising. So check it out um, if you're interested. Okay, um, so I think generally we covered everything high level about the model preparation, the data, the um, the uh, the hardware that you want to select, what are the specific metrics you want to fine tune for. Now, uh, I want to highlight that the data set preparation for either stages, the pre-training or inference, is a hugely important part. Um, just because if you have a if you have a, the data set that you haven't uh, actually uh, studied through, then uh, there might be some issues and hiccups that you can encounter later, um, and you'll have to debug everything at that point. You'll have to debug the, uh, the stability of training, you'll have to debug the data set, maybe the selection of the model, uh, maybe your code for the model creation. So like first step in all these stages, I recommend going through the data set preparation and then doing some sanity, check, sanity checks if you absolutely have no time to go through um, each step here. But um, in an, I want to explain the steps here. Those are the general steps that the community is following to creating all these large data sets uh, or even fine tuning data sets um, uh, that you are aware of. So for example, here the steps are highly um, inspired by OPT paper, the new X style uh, models paper. Um, and uh, the, uh, the PileV1 uh, code base that was released together with this data set. As the data set grows, those steps become more harder to implement. And um, I, will, I will discuss with you what Cerebris is doing right now to help the community get this done faster. Now, um, imagine like here we're working with the PileV1, right? The PileV1 data set consists of different types of sources, such as archive data set, PubMed, GitHub, et cetera. Um, the first step we usually people do, uh, we clean this data set. You can take a look at the subsample of the data set, at the real examples, um, understand if there are some issues with them, um, if you want to filter out some of the documents based on the content. Um, you know that this is a big data set, and whenever people download them from the internet, there might be some issues with connectivity, etc. So you might actually be cropping the documents. And if you are downloading that yourself, at this stage, you can actually understand you need to re-download them. Um, and uh, that can help you with the further stages. But if you, for example, given with already downloaded data set, then uh, you might want to clean those examples because model uh, will not learn anything useful in them. And if seen normalization, I also added it to the same box. Basically, you want to normalize the, 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 the tokens so there are no weird symbols because later we want to construct uh, the uh, tokens out of them. And uh, we assume that, for example, uh, the vocabulary that we already have. It's either pre-trained on some big corpus or we train it from scratch, but we don't want to like, create too many tokens. Um, okay, so the next stage, uh, so there is a, there is a deduplication that uh, uh, GPT-3 style papers, et cetera, they all recommend to do. The duplication happens at two different stages here. The first one, we want to deduplicate the whole data set against itself. That means that, um, Basically, if there is no desire to upsample some of the documents, then you might want to eliminate that uh, issue if that happened to be the case. So, for example, 
um, if you have a common crawl data set and C4 in your uh, combination, in your sources, then C4 is actually part of the common crawl. In that case, you might want to filter out some of the intersections. Um, of course, like when I, when I say here, like intersections, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is exact match, right? Um, you can you can think about like the distance metric between two different documents, and if they are close enough, then you can consider them as a duplicate. Now, there are multiple views on like whether to do this step or not, um, but uh, in terms of uh, like my perspective, if you can't do this step, I highly recommend to do that because if you want to, for example, increase the um, if you want to upsample some of the uh, um, examples, meaning like introducing the duplicates, then you can do that uh, in a more controlled way later. Because um, if, if, for example, at this stage you 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 had like a lot of duplicates and you decided not to go through the step even without like verification, that I might introduce some issues because model will memorize those examples and uh, will perform fully on your downstream tasks. Um, now. Another st another step here is um, it is um, deduplicating against downstream tasks. So if you have, uh, for example, a pre-trained corpus and a fine-tuned corpus, and you measure your quality at the end on some other corpus or in some other data sets, then uh, you don't want to leak any information from any training stage to any uh, validation stage. So this is what's happening here. Like usually, the pre if you if you create a the pre-tuning corpus from scratch or fine-tuning corpus, you want to check if there are any duplicates between the validation set that you have or the final uh, downstream task that you care about. So model does not cheat uh, at the pre-tuning stage. Okay, so once this step is done, and I must say like this is one of the hardest step uh, in the whole pipeline uh, because the duplication itself is the n square task where n is the size of the data set. If you have like terabytes of data, this is no way to go with that. Um, there, there are different types of implementations uh, that are available out there, uh, like mean hash, LSH uh, implementation, or you can create seam hashes. Um, those are approximate implementations that help you find the duplicates with a linear complexity instead of the um, squared. So, uh, at Cerebus, we're also exploring those. Um, after that, we want to combine all these different sources together. This is called interleaving. Um, at this stage, you can also introduce the weights with what you want to sample those documents with. Like, for example, I want to upsample archive. I would specify a sampling rate equal to like whatever the number. Like, if I want to double the size, I would just do two. And for everything else, I would do the weight equal to one. But you can also just interleave the documents uh, with equal weights. So after that, you want to shuffle the documents. Um, and this stage needs to be done because if you have some dependency in your original sources, you don't want the model to learn that dependency. So shuffling is important. Um, now, there are different types of shuffling algorithms you can do. and um, you can do that uh, if your data set can fit into the memory, you can do that in memory, or there are different types of shuffling algorithms that are introduced. Like one of them is two pass shuffling that uh, was used by Luther in file event creation, uh, allows you to, to uh, not fit the whole data set into the memory, uh, but uh, create chunks that you can fit into the memory and, uh, um, sample, uh, and shuffle those. Um, then you want to split in the training holdout. Uh, the whole doubt set is usually separated to be able to verify the model quality. It could be just a val set or it could be a val set and test set. And um, since we might have introduced uh, some weights in the past, like when we interleave the documents and upsampled some of the corpuses, we might end up having the intersection between train and holdout. And you want to deduplicate that. This task is way, way easier because usually your holdout set can be fit into the, can fit into the memory. So um, uh, it is way easier than duplicating the whole data set. Now, the next step would be tokenization. So depending on what tokenization you want to use, if you have your own vocabulary, or if you take like GPT-2 uh, tokenizer, or GPT and your X tokenizer, um, then this stage can happen after you duplicate the train and holdout. Um, and once you have the, the, the two corpuses uh, train and hold out for the train, we will, we will have to go through a few more steps here before we actually can train on it. But for hold out, um, usually uh, the only thing that you need to do is 
uh, pad the sequences to the specific MSL that you have. You can also do that at the model uh, when you train the model and validate the model at the data loader stage. And uh, but if you want to, for example, like split the test and eval, you, you can do that as well uh, in before you start training. Okay, um, same thing. Like you want to do duplicate tests and eval, so there is no leakage between them. Now um, let's say that um, we actually want to experiment with um, different types of upsampling, downsampling techniques with those corpuses. This is the stage we we can do that. Um, uh, you can either implement that as a part of your data loader, or you can do that uh, in advance and store the final data set and uh, train the model from it. So um, this technique, like basically, um, if for example, my downstream task is more related to, I don't know, biomedicine, then I would increase the size of the weights for those data sets that, that, are, uh, by, that have a biomedical domain. Um, but if, for example, um, I just want to play with the different types of upsampling, downsampling, um, I'll just specify like uh, a grid uh, of different types of weights and sample those uh, documents. Um, then what you need to do afterwards, you need to pack the sequences up to MSL again um, and iterate. Um, <clears throat> so I, this one, uh, I made a mistake here. We need to shuffle those sequences um, instead of the packing the sequences again. Um, and then we, we, we have the training set that we can uh, start the training on. Um, now, you might wonder why do we shuffle so many times? So like this part here, shuffling the documents because afterwards you want to pack the sequences together from different documents. You don't want the same documents to, to be packed together, like similar documents to be packed together um, in one sequence. So it is harder for the model to actually learn how to predict the next token. And then you want to shuffle the sequences here because you don't want the model to, uh, this is basically a, a good practice to shuffle your data set um, because the model will, can also learn some dependencies out of that. And um, you don't want to memorize uh, the, this dependency. You want to learn how to predict the next token. Okay, so this is the general steps on a data set preparation. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, feel free to uh, interrupt me. Um, okay, I would like to, uh, if there are no questions, I would like to go through Red Pajama V2 preparation. So he, we at Cerebrus uh, decided to help the community um, create the next version of Red Pajama data set. Um, this, this data set was originally released by Together Computer. Um, and um, this is basically an attempt to replicate the Llama data set that um, even though it was constructed from publicly available data, was not officially released to the community. Um, and uh, the, 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 another thing, people would want to train the Llama style models themselves, uh, given that you cannot actually use Llama checkpoints in commercial um, applications. So, um, Fred Pajan. Yeah. Hey, Dario, sorry. <clears throat> There's a, a question in the chat um, from Mario. Uh, does the system keep logs as the steps are done, or is it better left for the user? Okay. Yes, of course, we have a lot of logging. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, the steps, uh, can be done like in a sequence, uh, you can have some intermediate results stored in the disk. You can explore them as well. Um, or you can launch everything at once. Yeah, but definitely there, there is logging. Uh, we also create uh, a bunch of tests to verify every step here. So, um, that that's something that we, we care about, that uh, the, the steps are error prone and um, the code is readable and understandable. Perfect, thanks, Daria. Okay, um, so Red Pajama P2 again, like it's an attempt to build on top of released Red Pajama data set. Um, so when we first started, um, you can take a look at the GitHub from the Red Pajama uh, from Together Computer. Uh, there were a lot of steps that were already done for this data set, uh, but uh, to, to make it even better, uh, we decided to explore this data set. And um, one of the uh, decisions that we made is to create a Discord channel, Red Pajama V2, where we uh, basically communicate with the community. If you have any thoughts on how to improve this data set, um, I'm uh, also uh, with my team, we're also sharing the uh, insights on 
how we uh, decided to filter all of those documents, um, what are uh, the, the other steps that we want to take, what are other findings that we uh, came up with. And um, as we work with the uh, Red Pajama V2, we are also working on a scalable and memory efficient dataset preparation library that we would like to open source together with the Red Pajama V2. Um, so yeah, check out our Discord. Um, I already have, um, uh, we already found a uh, few, few suggestions from the community that we are uh, we're using in this data set preparation. So feel free to ask any questions there and I would be happy to, to learn more about your opinion here. Um, in terms of the data set itself, just a reminder, it's a collection, uh, it's a mix of different types of data sets. Um, uh, you can see here that we have a token count uh, uh, and uh, the, the total to to token count for this data set is 1.2 trillion. This is what um, 7 billion model uh, llama style was trained for. So yeah, um, uh, that we are very, very excited uh, about this, uh, about the releasing this data set and making it a bit better for the community. Okay, so um, to highlight a few other things that you might think about um, in addition to what I mentioned, uh, when you create your own application and you prepare your own data sets, either fine tuning or pre-training. So the first thing, uh, this is the most popular ones that I added, there are way more ways to customize the preparation, but I just wanted to motivate you all that the customization here can really contribute to the final quality because the, the data set is one of the, I would say, important metrics, important like um, parts that you can, you can optimize to make the, uh, the model better. So the first one, like language transfer, if you have, for example, the model trained on English data and you want to fine tune it with the German data, or um, I don't know, you want to have a mixture of the vocabulary, then you might want to think about, do I need to really learn how to tokenize the data set? Do I need to care about the language imbalance? Uh, like if I have enough of this language in my fine tuning data set to be able to learn from it. Um, you can also think about how do I want to expand the vocabulary? Do I want to learn more tokens? Do I want to uh, stay with the same vocabulary and uh, see like if the tokens can be mapped to it? So all these questions, um, you might want to think about them. Uh, there are certain best practices on how to do that as well, uh, depending on application. Um, but uh, here, like in case you think about uh, this type of work, uh, I'm just uh, providing like uh, a general information that you might want to think about this. Um, hey, Daria, sorry, this is yeah. maybe a silly question, but um, if someone were interested in training um, a large language model in a, in a new language, it's just, you know, Spanish, German, you know, um, is it more effective or is it is it better to leverage like a let's say the pre-training process or would it be better to you know fine-tune a model that was maybe you know used in english like the pile data set yeah so depending on your budget if you have enough data um, that you can um, add this data set into the pre-training stage um, and if you have enough time and for the for the budget flops for example right then i would I would recommend learning that at the pre-training stage. However, if your data set is very small and you don't really want to retrain the model, you can fine tune it with the expanded vocabulary and learn the tokens for this uh, data set uh, for this language uh, from scratch. I would recommend doing this approach. Got it, thank you. Um, so the next thing, it's actually, um, really interesting as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we have uh, pile one is constructed of like a set of different types of data sets, red pajama as well, right? Um, and those can consist of like biology, language, computer science, all the different types of sources, right? Math. <clears throat> so if you, for example, care mostly about coding, right? That can trigger your decision to align those specific data sets at pre-training stage. That could be either upsampling that specific data set, um, or if you can like gather more data for uh, code related stuff, right? Like, um, I don't know, Stack Exchange, uh, um, GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera, right? Get these data sets in the pre training stage, get them higher rates. And uh, this, is, this, this model will be more aligned to your specific business application. 
of course, like since uh, you guys are developing uh, and creating those applications, uh, working on the probably open source, um, highly commend doing uh, ensuring that you you verify for safety. You want to remove some noisy data uh, from your fine tuning stage. Uh, of course, I know like if you you're working with the pre-trained model already, that it is hard to understand that this model is biased or like it, it does any discrimination based on the pre-training corpus, but at least verifying that and finding those cases and maybe if you cannot afford pre-training from scratch and like a better curated data set, then uh, at least like finding those um, issues at the inference time and maybe replacing them with the more um, with the better content. Um, so yeah, uh, if, you, if there are other customizations that you can make and um, if you can name yours, uh, that would be great. Um, you can type it in the chat or share it with us in the Discord if you're developing. Okay, I guess like in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about the general practices for developing, deploying your own model. And then if there are any questions, then I'm happy to answer them. Um, so the first thing that uh, if I was developing the model myself, what I would check first, if I'm using the uh, pre-trained checkpoint by created by someone else, I would check the license. Cerebus GPT is shared with the Apache 2.0 license, so you can basically do whatever you want. But if you, for example, take Llama style model, uh, if you take Llama model, then uh, the license uh, is very strict. Um, so the next thing, um, I would select my hardware, whether I want to pre-train it from scratch or I want to fine tune it, uh, what is the best hardware like, given my budget. Um, later, I want to make sure that my application will be reliable. So uh, one of the, uh, if you can afford um, a, an inference of like a bunch of different models, um, for example, like uh, if one of the models performs worse, for example, you see that on your metrics that you uh, get uh, from the runtime, then other two, like if you have three models in total, other two can still save your uh, model prediction, right? So ensuring that you have either like an ensemble of models that are communicating between each other, producing the results um, or some other techniques that help you understand like, my model is uh, verifying the runtime metrics would be one of the things that ensures that you are reliable, creating some uh, metrics that also can verify that um, uh, the model is the model is reliable as well. Um, because yeah, I do, uh, at, at, at the last, uh, finally, you want to care about the user experience and for that, you don't want to uh, you, you don't want the, the application to produce some garbage out of the blue. Um, okay, so the next thing, uh, those can be implemented in parallel. You want to implement the inference pipeline. Those models, even though uh, people share the checkpoints, they don't automatically come with the generation code. Um, so you want to freeze the weights and you want to predict uh, one token at a time. Um, check out the Hagen phase um, inference pipeline. Um, and, um, or you can create your own uh, based, on the, uh, based on the examples. Uh, then you want to create A-B testing that helps you improve the model further in case you introduce a new feature, you introduce a new model uh, into the Ansible, you want to check um, if uh, your new feature is better than uh, before. So like, this is the concept of A-B testing. Um, and um, yeah, uh, verify that you are scalable and at performance, uh, per usually people uh, generate the output uh, with the batches instead of, um, one token at a time and also uh, if you can cache some output that that's also considered as a good practice. Um, of course, once you have your application, gather the feedback and not just for UI, but also for the model. Um, and you can use that feedback as the as the part of the fine tuning stage again and iterate uh, and improve model further. Um, and if you are developing, again, let us know about your application or if you're stuck with any steps and uh, we have a very welcoming, welcoming community in our Discord and we can help you with that. And also it would be really interesting to know what uh, people are developing on top of these large language models. Um, Daria, I wanted to say thank you so much. This was a really, really informative um, community meeting. So appreciate your time and your presentation. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. And yeah, we'll look forward to the next one. Yeah.